Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. It is uh, really an honor to be starting this strand on, uh, on, on really transforming education, and I'm also very happy to be speaking before the person who's coming up next. Um, this is a, uh, a really sweet spot in this conference, and I want to thank the conference organizers for giving it to me. Um, I'm going to start with a quote because I think that um, we, we are, are, when we think about change, when we think about transformation, I think we're not confused enough. Uh, and I love this, this quote by uh, Margaret Wheatley who says, you know, we can't be creative if we refuse to be confused. Change always starts with confusion. And that really is my thesis in this talk right now, is that we really aren't confused enough yet to transform education in the way that it may need to be transformed, given the changes that are happening with technology and the changes in the way we can connect and we can learn on our own. And so my job this afternoon is actually to confuse you. And you probably haven't heard too many presenters say that to you. But hopefully at the end of this 20 minutes or so, and if somebody wants to start the clock, that would be great, because otherwise I'll keep going all afternoon. But um, my job is really to confuse you, to get you thinking a little bit differently about the types of things that we have to be asking, the types of experiences that maybe we as individuals need to have in order to bring a different lens to this conversation and um, to really think differently about what's happening in the world right now when it comes to learning. So most of my confusion stems from these two guys. How many of you own two teenagers right now like I do? <laughs> All right, so they've created a new salon tonight for owners of two teenagers. It's happening at the tavern around the corner. Um, <laughs> If anyone has the manual, please let me know. My wife and I basically take a picture every time both of our kids are happy at the same time, and this is number seven in that series. It's not, <laughs> not something that happens very often. And did you see the good job I did uh, photoshopping in the name on his shirt? That's pretty good, isn't it, right? Actually, my wife is a graduate of Georgia Tech, an industrial engineer, and why she married me, I have no idea. But anyway, here's my confusion. My kids come home on a regular basis from school, and the learning that I see them doing looks very little like the learning I see them doing on their technology, on the computers that they have, on the access that they have. And I know that my kids are privileged. I understand that. And I know that not every child, in fact, many children don't have access to the web. And to me, that's almost a moral imperative these days. I can't imagine how kids without access are going to compete with the kids who have it, and especially the kids who have it and who know what to do with it. But I ask questions like, why is school the only place in my kids' worlds where they can't take the technology out of their pockets and backpacks and answer the questions that they're being asked? It's the only place in their lives when they get asked a question, they're told, you can't take that out. You can't Google it. If I, if I said there's a free iPad to the first person in here who could tell me what caused the demise of the Gupta Empire, what would you all do right now? You would all take out your technology and go to Google and start looking at it. But my kids can't do that. And that confuses me now, because that in and of itself um, gives them a very different sense about what learning looks like in the classroom, as opposed to what learning looks like outside the classroom. And I, I understand that just looking up facts is not learning. But as you'll see, I think we're talking about much more in terms of the opportunities here. So I have a lot of different biases here and a lot of opinions about this. And I just want to go through these really quickly. Number one. I think this may be the most disruptive moment ever in education. And if you're not feeling confused, if you're an educator and you're not feeling confused, or a parent, and you're not feeling confused about what's happening in schools and what's happening in terms of the learning experience your kids are having, I don't think you're paying attention, to be honest with you. Um, I, I think that there are many things here that we're going to have to deal with and grapple with in some big ways. Yet, I, have, I can't believe that there's been a more amazing time to be a learner. And I am a poster child for this. I started blogging back in 2001. My connections online have literally transformed the way I think about education because of the learning I can do with people outside of my physical space at a moment's notice connected to people who share my passions in, way, in ways that didn't exist even a decade ago. And I can't even imagine what it's going to be like 10 years from now. now I absolutely believe that schools are the most important parts of our communities. There's no question about that, and I don't want you to think in any way that I'm suggesting we should get rid of schools. But I am suggesting that schools now need to be different. We can't keep trying to make the traditional system better, because better is becoming less and less relevant by the day. And we have to start to think differently. And here's the biggest issue that I have right now. And that is most of the people who are in schools, teachers and leaders and policymakers who are building policy around schools, I don't, I'm not sure that they have enough of an experience in terms of learning with technology in the ways my kids are learning with technology 
to make relevant and meaningful decisions about my kids. And I am in no way throwing them under the bus. They are good people. They care about kids. They want what's best for kids. That's not a question. But the question is, are they looking at the world as it is from a learning context, not as it was, not as it, you know, it's been for 100 years or so trying to make that better, keep making that better with every decision that we make? I think we have to be really, really different. So basically, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of kids who do have that context, who do have that lens. 14-year-old Jacob Arnott from Melbourne, who a couple of years ago started a blog about sports because he loves sports. And basically, because of the work that he did in there, last year he went to London and covered the Australian Olympic team on a press pass and thankfully made the decision to take three weeks off of school because they go to school in the summer down there, take the three weeks off of school to go and do that work, or these girls who basically had been tired of being bullied and decided to do something about it, not just for themselves, but to create a real community of people, of kids from around the world who can find support, who can find connections, who can, who can just reach out to one another and basically help one another through what is a terrible situation. Or one of my favorites, actually, Super Awesome Sylvia. Has anyone ever seen a Super Awesome Sylvia video? A couple hands have gone up. Super Awesome Sylvia teaches me more about science than I ever learned in school. And it's because, it's because she has a passion for science that is just, you, you can't help but be passionate about what she's working on. And the cool thing is, is that she's making videos and she's doing all these experiments, making videos and sharing them with us. And she's got hundreds of thousands of people that watch her YouTube video, her YouTube channel. And on a, almost on a weekly basis, you can find something really interesting and somewhat geeky but fun that she's doing. Um, that you can learn from. Now, these kids understand that it's not just about time and place learning. It's not just about the people in your face-to-face -face world. It's about the connections that you can make because of these technologies that literally haven't, didn't exist when my kids were born. Um, this has happened so quickly that it's been difficult for us to get our brains around it, but I really think that we need to understand it now. This is huge change. And it is this change that we've gone from scarcity of information, knowledge, teachers, technology, to a literal, wor literal world of abundance of that stuff within about 10 or 15 years. And it's been just a huge, huge shift that's been very difficult to track. You look at this list, you can read some of these. The one that strikes me as just overwhelming is next year, there are going to be a billion photos uploaded to the web every single day. Every single day. And my kids will take about 10,000 of those. But there are going to be... <laughs> We are just going to be swimming in information. If you think it's overwhelming now, just wait and think about the worlds that our kids are going to enter. Think about all of the information that they're going to have at their fingertips, all of the people that they're going to be able to interact with. It's an overwhelming thing when you think about it. I love this quote by Michael Wesch. You know, we live now in a world marked by ubiquitous computing, ubiquitous information, and ubiquitous networks at unlimited speed about everything everywhere from anywhere and all kinds of devices that make it ridiculously easy to connect, organize, share, collect, collaborate, and publish. And I would ask you to raise your hands right now if your kids' schools or the schools that you work in sound like that. Hardly anyone. Hardly anyone. But yet, if we have access and if we know what to do with it, that is a powerful, powerful change when it comes to the way we can learn and the way we can connect. So here's our challenge. I want you to look at this picture and I want you to imagine this is every piece of information. This is all the knowledge that we carry around in our pockets. This is the sum of human knowledge. Actually, it's the library at Stuttgart. But imagine that this is it, right? And if this is all the knowledge that we now have access to, welcome to school. We're the two shelves up in the upper left-hand corner that haven't changed very much over the years. And they're the ones that basically we developed because we were building schools at a time of scarcity. That those were the things we needed every child to know. And basically now we're saying to kids, these are your shelves. We will make you masters of these shelves. But the rest of the library, hmm, good luck. And think of this picture as all of the potential teachers in our lives. And these are teachers in my life, by the way. These are people who I interact with on Twitter. And basically, think if those are all the people that I can learn from, well, then welcome to school again. And that's not to say that these people don't care for kids, that they aren't working really hard to help nurture and support and, and encourage my kids to succeed in every way possible. They absolutely are. But let's, not make the, let's make sure we understand the distinction between the two. 
And then if you look at this and you imagine that this represents all of the tools, all of the technologies, all of the ways that we can connect, all of the ways that we can collaborate with other people and make things and communicate and whatever else, well then welcome to school because we don't do any of that. We don't want that kind of connection to happen by and large outside of the four walls. We fear that more than we understand it. And again, I would say that's because we're not confused enough. We haven't grappled with that as much as we need to because those tools are powerful and those tools and technologies are really, really interesting. But here's the thing. If we understand and if we can take advantage of this and this and this, if we get that in our core, in our practice, and in our brains, and we can understand what that means, that can lead us to transformation. It really can. And that's transformation in a big way. That's not just tinkering on the edges. That's not just about getting better. It's about being really different. And basically, it demands, this environment demands a shift away from institutionally organized learning and education to a more learner-centered organized, or learner-organized education. It demands it. Because if you look at kids when they go online and they pursue the things that they are interested in, they are creating their own educations. They are basically developing their own curriculum. They are finding their own teachers. They are creating their own classrooms. And that is a powerful, powerful thing, but it is a hugely challenging thing to us as teachers and educators and schools. And by the way, this is not whole language or new math. This is not going away. This is not an option. We can't simply say, oh yeah, this internet thing, or this technology thing, or this connection thing, we don't really have to deal with that. We absolutely do. We absolutely have to come to understand this in a fundamentally different way. So if you're not confused yet, think about this. In a self-organized modern learning world, where we have abundant access to teachers, to content, to information, to technologies, how do we define a school? If I don't need to send my child to your school to learn algebra anymore, if I don't need to send my child to your school to learn history or French, not to say I don't want to send them there, but if I don't need to send them there, if we're going to measure their expertise on algebra by their ability to pass a test, I don't need you for that any longer. How do we define a school now? How do we define a teacher? When expertise around the things that we teach can be found outside of the walls in maybe greater depth. I know the first thing I learned when I got an internet connection was, I'm not the smartest person in the room anymore. And my job becomes, let me find the smartest people and bring them into the room with my kids. How do we define literacy? You think literacy that got us through the 20th century, reading and writing in paper-based environments, is going to sustain us in a digital environment where we can create so many things and link to so many other people and texts and whatever else? And finally, how do we define an education? Are we really going to say, from this point forward, that we're not going to give credit or we're not going to value any of the informal, deep, powerful learning that people can do on their own. That the only way you can get an education is to sit somewhere for a certain period of time with a certain group of others in an institution somewhere that says, yes, you have done this particular work. These are the types of questions that we have to ask, and that redefinition is really important right now. We have to talk about this because mastering this is a whole lot different for mastering this. They are two very, very different things. And they are two powerful ways to learn. Again, there's a lot of learning that happens in this place. And I don't want my kids to be without face-to-face -face interactions, to be without teachers who care about them. But this can't be the only way that we think about learning now. It can't be the only way that we think about an education. And mastering this, basically, requires more than just a, co a concentration on four Cs. I mean, creativity, which Sir Ken is going to talk a lot about, I'm sure, as he comes up next. And collaboration, and communication, and critical thinking. These are all really, really important. And I'm not in any way suggesting that we, that we don't focus on those things in schools. But these are not new. These are not new things. These are not new skills and dispositions. But I think there are two new Cs that we do have to think about. And they are computing, and connections. Those are the two. You know, this is a picture of my network. I'm at the center of that. There are people from around the world who I interact with on a regular basis. This is a powerful place to learn. If you told me that I could only learn with the people in my face-to-face -face world, you realize you would be eliminating about 99% of my opportunities to learn right now. 
If you told me that I could only learn from people who I know, regardless of whether face-to-face -face or on my network, you'd be eliminating about 99% of my learning opportunities right now. I would think there wouldn't be a person in this room who doesn't want to be found by strangers on the internet to learn with them. I do. And my kids are going to be learning with strangers every single day of their lives. Now, you know, we think about that, and that upsets some people. It makes them uncomfortable. It, we look at that and we go, yeah, right, I'm not doing that. But think about it. Are you really going to say to kids, you can't learn with people who you don't know? You can't learn with people who are out there, who, ha who share your passions, who are building authentic, meaningful, incredible things. We're not going to let you learn with them. I don't think we can do that any longer. And by the way, computing is the currency of my kids' success. Connections and computing. Their ability to understand how to make help computers to solve problems, to create beautiful, meaningful, authentic work and share it with the world, work that changes the world, that is currency in their lives right now. And we have to understand those two C's as much as we understand the other four C's. And it begs this important question. In this world, if we look at it and understand it and see it for what it is, and it is here, this is the world that we live in right now, can we as educators and policymakers make relevant, informed decisions about just about everything that we do in school, everything that affects our kids' lives? Can we really make, make relevant decisions without a personal context, a personal lens of what computing and connections look like in our own lives? Can we really prepare them to be learners in this modern world if we ourselves are not learners in that, in that regard? Can we really do that? So, are you changing? How are you creating, using computers to solve problems, to create things in meaningful and important ways? How are you connected to people around the world who share your passions, with whom you can learn at a moment's notice? Because the transformation has to start here before we can transform our schools, before we can transform our education system. We have to bring this lens to bear on the conversations that we have around what schools should look like. You know, this is the world at our doorstep. In 2020, there will be 5 billion people connected to the internet. 5 billion. Think about that for a second. And that's not just 5 billion, that's 5 billion potential learners at our fingertips. 5 billion learners who will be connecting and creating 5 billion kids and people who will change the world. They will change the world. That is no, there's no question about that. And they will not take the two shelves up in the top left-hand corner of the library as a substitute for the education they can have on the internet with other people. And they will not take just five people or the people in their face-to-face in their -face -face worlds as the teachers that can impact them and can help them learn on a regular basis. Those things will be important, but they cannot be the only ways that we think about learning. So our students need our help here. You know, we hear people say all the time, oh, my kid's so good with technology and they can figure it out, and people laugh at the blinking VCR stories that we used to tell, you know, and kids would always program that, that, that stuff for us. But they are not learners in these contexts. They are social, they can hack technology, they can figure it out maybe more than we can, but they don't know how to learn deeply with these technologies. And basically, they need us to be different in order to help them through that. So I'm going to invite you to be more confused in your conversations, to ask different questions, and to be a learner, because in the words of my favorite quote from Eric Hoffer, in times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned will be beautifully equipped for a world that no longer exists. <laughs> and so do it for my kids, please. Do it for all of the kids in our communities, all of the kids who are exploring the world in ways that didn't exist for most of us when we were growing up. And please remember that this is the most amazing time to be a learner maybe ever, and that for our kids, it's especially amazing if we can show them the way. Thanks very much for your time this afternoon. I appreciate it.